In this episode, U Lethbridge education professor Dr. Sandra Dixon discusses owning her voice and speaking truth in academic spaces. Dr. Dixon addresses her positionality as a woman of color at a predominantly white university that values liberal education. However, these values are not always translated into transformative and tangible actions. Dr. Dixon sheds light on how the resilience of her faith has empowered her to deal with complexity, diversity, and change in dominant white spaces. Attendees are invited to reflect on their own privilege and consider ways to take actionable, meaningful steps to walk the talk. It is a pleasure for me to be here tonight. The lights are pretty bright in here. Um, <laughs> um, and so I'm honored to have all of you come out to hear me speak about owning my voice and speaking my truth in academic spaces. I'd like to start off as well with the Afrocentric land acknowledgement. As a person of African descent, I am mindful that as a settler, I walk on the lands inhabited and cared for by many indigenous peoples past, present, and future. I also walk on a pathway that black African ancestors and community settlers have paved for their ongoing work on advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion, otherwise known as EDI, of all black individuals. And it's with great humility that I am aware that many of my ancestors were forcibly brought to these lands as a result of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. And like Dean Starr said, I'd like to reflect and take a few minutes to think about the land where we're currently standing. I also wanted to acknowledge the communications team who put this event together. They have done a lot of work behind the scenes, and so I'm truly grateful for their help to make tonight possible. Catherine Reeder, who invited me to this talk, Alicia, Danica, Austin, Trevor and Kaylee, they all made tonight possible. So thank you very much. I also want to acknowledge the funding that I received for this project. The Strategic Graduate Employment Fund operates through the University of Lethbridge, the Research and Innovation Services Department, the Prentice Institute Research Seed Grant from the University of Lethbridge, and the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Scholar Award from the University of Lethbridge. My goals for tonight is threefold. And first, I want to facilitate a brief space for discussion that can help to identify the systemic changes required in academia. I'm intentionally using the word brave versus safe because I think what I'm hoping for us to do is to lean in tonight into our discomfort versus back in a way resisting those discomfort that we might feeling having these meaningful discourses. I'm inviting critical reflections and self-reflexivity around the concepts of EDI in higher education. And I'm advocating for non-performative action in academic spaces wherein all racialized voices are valued, heard, and respected. It would be remiss of me not to acknowledge my research team, myself, the principal investigator on the project, Dr. Cecile de Paz, who is co-editor, research consultant, and advisor, and our graduate assistant, Milibada. They have been very instrumental in making this project possible. Now, I thought it was fitting to share this quote with you by Audre Lords. I am constantly being encouraged to pull out some one aspect of myself and present this as the meaningful whole, eclipsing or denying the other parts of myself. And I emphasized some one aspect because it is fitting and it relates to my social location how I show up tonight in this space, and how I represent myself. And so for me, I would view myself as a cisgender, 
meaning my gender identity coincides with my assigned sex at birth. I'm a person of faith, heterosexual, educated, black, Jamaican Canadian, and an immigrant woman. The reality is that social, social cultural identity is a very complex concept. And so, for me, while part of my identity might provide social advantages, another part may create challenges in terms of EDI issues. And so I'll give an example is that oftentimes when I'm in certain places and spaces, I am mindful of presenting myself as a person of faith due to the fact that I might, miss, might be perceived in a certain light and I might be othered and there might be biases. And I've experienced that in the past in academic setting. I recalled submitting my work for publication on one occasion and the topic centered around faith and the feedback that I received from one of the individuals was that the topic was too contentious and it was not accepted. And that incident really impacted my intersectional identity as a woman of faith. Reason being because it is a core part of who I am. It's how I show up in spaces and it really took a toll in terms of my identity, in terms of my capability. And I felt some way inadequate. And so I like to somewhat call myself an undercover Christian person because I really don't want to be forthcoming about who I am. Needless to say, that work that I submitted was also um, received and published in another setting. But there are also aspects of my intersectional identities that give me certain privileges. And so being educated is one of the areas that I value and that I acknowledge has given me certain privileges in certain contexts. So for instance, I'm here tonight because I'm educated and because I'm able to share my knowledge. And it's important to think about how the interplay between aspects of my identity shapes my lived experiences in academia as I continue to work to interrogate EDI, anti-oppression, social justice, and issues in dominant white spaces. So I really want you to think about your intersectional identities and those areas that you have to hide because of how you might be perceived by others in your context and those that you're able to celebrate and acknowledge because those are accepted. There are some key concepts I want to speak to tonight that is relevant to my research. The first is racialized academic women. And in the context of my work, it refers to individuals who self-identify as black, indigenous, and women of color in higher education. And you might see the term being called BIWOC. So that is oftentimes used interchangeably in the literature. But saying that, I'm also mindful and recognize that this concept, BIWOC, or racialized academic women, amalgamates distinct experiences of racism and can be oppressive for many individuals. And so it can exclude people who do not fit into that category. And being cognizant of this fact, we are mindful that the scholars participating in our, in our project do have the freedom and flexibility to use a term that reflects their intersectional identities, whatever that might look like. Another term that we have he heard often and is used in many contexts is EDI, and so I'm gonna unpack those in the context of my work. Equity is a process that results in the equal, fair, and respectful treatment of everyone, irrespective of race, gender, culture, creed, etc. Diversity focuses on the rich and unique representation of equity-deserving de groups, 
including racialized individuals. And inclusion reflects the creation of culturally brave environments where all people are welcomed, valued, and empowered. And again, I want to emphasize brave spaces and environments versus safe spaces and environments. It's important for me to speak about the relevant research background of my project. And I'm going to look at the Canadian context. There was research done by Universities Canada. They completed a national survey on EDI at Canadian universities. And they contacted 96 universities. Only 88 participated, including the U.S. And there was many information gathered from the research. However, for the purpose of my talk tonight, I'm going to highlight the key results in senior leadership. And we had approximately 1,140 individuals who participated. And based on the findings, it showed that racialized people were significantly underrepresented in senior leadership positions. And because of that underrepresentation, they failed to advance through the leadership pipeline. The results also showed that racialized individuals who had a population of 22%, a student body of 40%, both undergraduate and graduate, uh, doctoral holders of 31%, and full-time faculty at 21%, despite these large numbers to a certain degree, they only occupied 8% in senior leadership at these 88 Canadian universities. That is quite a staggering number. And a subgroup of the racialized population being black individuals, graduate students who were black represented only 6% within the 88 universities, university professors only 1.9%, and university leaders less than 1%. Now, I really want you to allow those statistics to really sink in, to see the huge racial disparity that exists even within the Canadian context. And another subgroup, indigenous people, represented only 3% at senior university leadership positions, and that was lower than the general population of 5%. There's also a study conducted in the Canadian context that I wanted to shed some light on. And it was done by Hughes and colleagues. They investigated gender-based harassment and discrimination among 244 academic women. And based on the findings, slightly over one in seven individuals I self-identified as racialized, and less than one in 25 self-identified as indigenous. So quite a small number based on the sample size. But there were three main categories that were highlighted that I want to bring to your attention. The first being overt practices. And so these were discrimination and harassment on even distribution of workload and responsibilities and inequitable pay that were reported by racialized individuals in university um, settings. They also talked about covert practices. And these were social isolation. So meaning there are cases where racialized women were not invited to participate in events that would lead to networking and further advancement in their career in academia. They experienced barriers to promotion and racially oriented microaggressions. And these are very subtle, indirect speeches, behaviors that racialized individuals experience on a daily basis that over time can become toxic, harmful, and traumatizing. They also talked about silencing. And so in these cases, they were not allowed to speak their truths and talk about their experience then because they will be ostracized in the university context by their colleagues. And so we see that 
there is definitely structural and institutional factors at play here. And so because of these factors, it created a very chilly and frigid environment for racialized individuals to navigate. And more so, they had very limited support from their male counterparts. I want to shed light to the United States in that context. Based on its colonial history, we see that universities were not designed for women, particularly uh, racialized individuals. And the research shows that there's approximately 13.4% uh, of black people in the United States, but only less than 6% of faculty at the public and private non-profit four-year colleges. And because of this underrepresentation, they have limited visibility across disciplines. They are not in large numbers in terms of senior ranks at the universities and especially at research intensive universities where you have to have a lot of grant funding and research is a big part of that context. There's also data collected by the American Council on Education and they looked at the 2015-2016 timeframe. And they found that blacks and Asians maintain less than 18% of the total US graduate enrollment while whites remain the majority at 56%. There's also another report by the National Center for Education Statistics, and they found that full-time faculty in post-secondary institutions consisted of 5% Asian Pacific Islander females, 3% black females, 3% Hispanic females, compared to their white female counterparts at 35%. So again, you see the common thread happening across the North American context. Now I want to take you over to the United Kingdom and see what we can find. So based on the census that um, was conducted in 2021 20, in the UK, it showed that the white population is the largest at 81%, Asian ethnic groups at 9.3%, followed by blacks at 4%, and other racialized groups followed the mix at 2.9%, and other ethnic groups at 2.1%. Now, how does that translate to the, um, the uh, higher institution context? So we see that racialized individuals, women, academics, are also underrepresented in the UK higher education sector. And this underrepresentation impacts recruitment, it impacts retention and career progression. There's also data collected by the Higher Education Statistic Agency. And based on the report from the year 2021-2022, it showed that they had over 22,000 professors at higher academic levels, and of that number, black professors represented only 0.7%, which amounted to 160 individuals. That's quite a staggering number. And based on the 160 black professors, 35% of those black professors were female professors in the entire UK region, representing only one, only 0.15%. And when they asked about ethnicity, we see that black professors was less than 1%, same as previous years. Asians were 8%, and whites were the majority at 88%. So again, we see the common thread across the different contexts where there's huge racial disparity in academic settings. And again, we could relate that to the systemic issues that are at play in the structural issues. And so their experiences are similar to the North American context. They talk about invisibility, not being seen, not being heard, 
They talk about hypervisibility. In those cases, they are seen as a token individual that are put on the website. They are put on every EDI committee that is formed. Um, and so they are really pushing the forefront to be the representation for the entire ethnic group that they belong to that can be emotionally taxing and problematic. They talk about microaggressions, similarly to the um, North American context, and also over and in covert, racialized, and gendered abuse. So clearly there's a common thread happening across the Western context. And so based on the research background, I was curious to know, how can the scholarship of research for EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion, among racialized academic women of intersectional identities, enhance and strengthen multiple disciplines, policy making, and administration in academia? So for the, res the theoretical framework for this project, I want to use intersectionality theory because it emphasizes the need to conceptualize various forms of inequality related to gender, race, sexuality, or immigrant status. It also reveals a complex picture of how racialized groups, including BIWOC graduate students, academics, administrators, are othered and marginalized in academic settings and in society at large. And so we see that the intersectional identities of racialized individuals can exacerbate challenges in academia. And when that happens, it reduces their opportunity for advancement, for full-time tenure positions, and for promotions. The methodology that we're using for this project is document analysis. And it provides a first person account of an individual's stories, actions, subjective experiences, beliefs, and worldviews. And we see that by documenting an individual's story, it honors oral tradition, and it serves as a gateway to knowledge that can deconstruct values assumptions, and beliefs, which is what we're hoping by undertaking this project. Document analysis is suitable for this project because storytelling is used to center the experiences of racialized scholars whose truths, experiences, realities in white dominant spaces are often deemed irrelevant, not important, othering. For the data collection and the project structure, we are seeking contributions from racialized women academics in the forms of essays and poetry. And these individuals are instructors, lecturers, faculty members, administrators, graduate students, and they're located in Western settings because we do know that colonization, that plays a role in the Western context and how narratives are being told and constructed and deconstructed. The research project is organized into overarching themes and so the contributors have the agency to be able to write uh, based on a theme that fits with their lived reality. And it's gonna help with the structure and the framework of the project. And we're doing calls to action around teaching, research, practice, and policy making. And we were intentional in doing calls to action versus implication because we believe that calls to action offer tangible and concrete strategies for creating systemic changes in academia. And the outcome is going to be a co-edited volume. In terms of the relevance of our results, the narratives and analyses in this project will be an important resource for educators, policymakers, and practitioners in the field of social justice, education, psychology, social work, and anti-racism. We also think the outcome will offer unique opportunities for critical thinking, self-reflections, 
self-reflexivity, self-discovery, and exploration by students, educators, policymakers, and promote meaningful institutional changes. The project will also provide professional guidance and, and ideas for future research areas on issues related to EDI concerns in which gender, race, culture, and intersectionality of identities are important and critical. Now, I talked earlier about EDI, and I unpacked that a little bit for you. I'm going to go a bit further and talk about adopting an EDI framework in academia. We see that in recent years, the social movements related to the murder of Joy Floyd, which many of you saw live on TV, the Black Lives Matter movement, these movements place an international spotlight on anti-black racism in all aspects of society, including in academia. I want to unpack anti-black racism concept for those of you who might not be familiar with it. So anti-black racism is a concept coined by Canadian scholar in social work, Dr. Akua Benjamin. She highlights that it highlights systemic practices and, and policies rooted in Canadian institutions, like education that discriminate against people of black African descent. We see that because of the social movements that happened, higher education institutions were encouraged to demonstrate a commitment to EDI efforts. And so because of that, most universities in Canada have adopted an EDI framework that was motivated by the 2020 Scarborough Charter on Anti-Black Racism and Black Inclusion in Canadian Higher Education. They were focused on principles, actions, and accountabilities in academia. And this was a, a step in the right direction because the charter provides guidelines for Canadian higher institutions to follow in creating their own action plans to foster black inclusion. And so today there's approximately 50 universities and colleges who have signed the document, including the ULEF, which is a good thing. And I wanna give attention to the words of the former president and vice chancellor, Dr. Mike Mahone. And he stated, by signing the charter, the ULEF is committed to doing our ethical part in addressing these social injustices and creating safe, inclusive spaces for all. Very powerful statement to make. But it's important for us to really take a critical lens when looking at the EDI framework in academia. And so we see what tends to happen is institutional EDI statements are often presented as proof or evidence that academic institutions are indeed inclusive, indeed equitable, and indeed welcoming of diversity. And the question is, is that the case? No, it's not. Because there's a gap between the rhetoric and practice, and this is labeled as the equity myth. And I like the words here by scholar Ahmed. She states, a fantasy of inclusion is a technique of exclusion. The idea that we're inclusive, the myth behind it, doesn't mean that you are being inclusive. You're actually being exclusive. And we see that the fantasy of inclusion and being performative can lead to really violent practices because what they do is that they continue to harm, exclude, push out, tokenize, traumatize, and otherwise racialized bodies. And so when racialized academics, and I say we, we become a problem in academia when we describe a problem. And oftentimes individuals are racialized as seen as aggressive, problematic, being seen as resistant, and so forth. And that takes a toll overall 
on their mental health and well-being. So what I'm advocating for tonight in this space is for us to consider a cultural shift and for us to move beyond inclusion to an expansion framework in academia. You may be wondering, what does that look like? So when we think of expansion framework, it involves a practice of co-constructing community across differences by broadening and deepening social networks in higher education to benefit the needs of racialized academics and academics in general. Because we do see that higher education tends to be very performative in that racialized bodies are superficially represented as a form of tokenism and not because of their expertise or capabilities. But if we're thinking about an expansion framework, this will allow for performative, non-performative actions that give racialized faculty the agency to engage in equitable, diverse systems. So I am beseeching universities, including the ULF, to move beyond inclusion initiatives and expand efforts to generate transformative change without judgment and without authorization of racialized individuals, but all individuals in general. And so it brings me to the significance of my research because again, we see based on the background information that racialized act academic faculty, administrators, and graduate students, they continue to experience negative, oppressive colonial practices in higher education. And so for that reason, our project is timely, it's vital, and it's necessary, given the social cultural climate in which we're currently residing. So this scholarship, we believe, will lay the foundation for the following. Increased practice, teaching, policy making, and institutional consciousness, inclusive community building, and cultural humility, cultural safety, and cultural sensitivity within academic spaces. Thus far, we have shared our research in different settings for knowledge mobilization and translation. I was honored to present at the EDI Scholar Forum that was organized by Martha, who is with us tonight, who is a part of the EDI office at the University of Lethbridge. We also presented last year at the OTESA Conference, which is the Open Technology in Education, Society, and Scholarship Association Conference. We'll be presenting this March at the 19th Annual Education and Development Conference, and also in June at the Canadian Society for the Study of Education Conference. Before I end my talk tonight, I want really to lay out some cons considerations for my research. I really want to foster deeper collaboration and commitment from senior white male leaders white women, people of color, and other racialized communities to promote expansion efforts and move beyond inclusion in academia. I want to push back against performative activism, otherwise known as slacktivism, because it is very surface level activism. It merely serves to increase one's own social capital and is not a commitment to creating systemic institutional change. I also want to facilitate brave conversations, not safe conversations. And I want to facilitate this around oppressive, um, oppressive experiences of many racialized faculty members in academia. I'm also hoping to dismantle the colonial structures that are deeply rooted within Western institutional systems and honor and acknowledge the unique intersectional identities of racialized women scholars whose voices are often misrepresented and dismissed in white dominant and privileged spaces. 
And lastly, but not least, to continue a much needed conversation about racialized academics and encourage a more rigorous documentation of their intersectional experiences. Thank you for listening to my talk, and I will welcome any questions at this time. In the next episode, U Lethbridge neuroscience professor Dr. Rob Sutherland gets scientific with his talk, asking, why is the brain important?